What communion is designed to do is bring you into a deeper level of intimate partnership with the Lord on the spiritual level. It is the point of intimacy that God has uniquely given his people if you are associated with him that takes what he did 2,000 years ago and allow you through communion to experience it today. When Jesus is talking about communion, he's not talking about something casual. He's talking about something very important, very significant. And then he says, I want you to remember me. Not God, the Father, no, me. Communion is about me. When you take the bread and take the cup, he says, I want you to remember me. That I am the centerpiece of this event. He says that communion is ongoing because he says, as often as you eat it, you are to be reconnected with the covenant. It's like saying to a married couple, as often as you are intimate. Now, you can be married when you're not intimate, but he's saying as often as you are intimate. What he's saying is, I'm giving you a special time with me. Amen. This is not regular life. This is an intimate time. This is different than all the other times we're together eating or going out or driving in the car or working around the house. All of those are part of our relationship, but this is different. And as often as you do, as often as you select this intimate act, you are doing something else Amen. that's not part of your normal Christian life. That's not part of your normal Christian experience. And so he says, When you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Ah. He says communion involves a proclamation. That there is a communication occurring. There is a declaration occurring that is part of the communion experience. So, if there is no proclamation, then you haven't entered into the experience of a new level of intimacy. So, the question is what am I proclaiming? What, what, what am I talking about? Well, I mean, when I take communion, I'm not talking. I'm not interacting, but he says when you eat the bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming. Something is being declared Amen. relative to what I'm doing now. The cup and the bread, the body and the blood, the body being his life, the cup being his death, what exactly am I supposed to be doing so that I can benefit from this experience whenever I have it? Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Having been built, having been put to death in the flesh body, but made alive in the spirit. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God 
kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, which is eight persons who brought safety through the water, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Stay with me here. On Good Friday, Jesus died from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock the Son of God bore the wrath, the wrath of God, he says, for our sins. The world became dark at the death of Christ because of the divine judgment that he bore. On Sunday morning, he rose. He got up from the grave. But you haven't heard enough sermons about Saturday. On Friday, he died. On Sunday, he arose. But 1 Peter 3 says on Saturday, he was busy. He says between his death and resurrection, when he died, he was alive in the spirit, it says. So his body laid in Nicodemus' tomb, but Jesus in his spirit was very much alive. And in the life of his spirit, it says he visited those who were incarcerated. So after Jesus died, before Jesus arose, he went on a ministry trip. And on the ministry trip, According to verse 20, uh, verse, verse 18, he died, he's put to death in the flesh, and verse 19, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. So between Jesus' death while still alive in the spirit and his resurrection, he went and talked to spirits that were trapped in order to bring about their deliverance against that which was illegitimately holding them hostage. He brings up Noah. Two things happened with Noah. The world was judged and eight people were delivered because of the ark. He ties the ark to the work of Christ, Jesus being the ark. Judgment fell, but at the same time, deliverance was given because of sin working itself in the world. He declares that there was a proclamation. Did you know that at the heart of communication, you are at communion, you should be proclaiming something. The first thing you can proclaim is Satan go to hell. Because that's where he is. You can declare he no longer can hold you hostage. He no longer can put you in prison where you can't function in the way God designed you to function because he's holding you as a prisoner of war and illegitimately hostage, okay? At the very same time, you can declare your freedom and victory because he says in Noah's time, eight people were saved. Then Jesus came back physically and rose from the dead. So he died on Friday, 
delivered on Saturday and rose to a brand new life on Sunday. He says, when you have communion, you are to remember him. But what does it mean to remember? Does it merely mean to recall, okay, think back and remember that something happened? Certainly, remembering includes recalling. Mm, but is that all? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, one page back from our central passage. Verse 16 says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he. Are we? Please notice a word throughout that passage. He talks about the bread. He talks about the drink. And then he says, and you have become sharers. He says partakers or participants. So when he says in chapter 11 to remember, he's not just saying, I want you to recall something in the past. What he's saying is, I want you to participate based on the past with something in the present. I want you to be a sharer or a participant. And he says there are two types of sharing. He says there's the table of God and there's the table of demons. And you can participate with either. When you go to lunch with someone and you say, let's have lunch, let's break bread together, you're not just talking about food. You're talking about fellowship. Amen. You're talking about getting together. You're talking about connecting. Now, maybe you talk to him on the phone, or maybe you see him in passing, but the moment you bring up a table, you're bringing up another level of intimate conversation, communication, and attachment to them because you are now sharing. You are now participating. You are now partnering. What communion is designed to do is bring you into a deeper level of intimate partnership with the Lord on the spiritual level so that his Saturday can become your Sunday. So that his speaking to the spiritual realities that inform our physical realities can take us to a place in the spiritual where Satan no longer is running our lives. It is the point of intimacy that God has uniquely given his people, unlike your general Christian life, if you are associated with him, that takes what he did 2,000 years ago and allow you through communion to experience it today. He says in 1 Peter, he arose and he's gone to heaven. He is not physically here, but he is spiritually here. He wants you to remember that the same thing he did 2,000 years ago in delivering us from sin, the hold of Satan bringing us to victory is what he does today. And he wants to give you the experience of that around his ordinance called communion. He does it there unlike he does it in any other place. It's a level of intimacy that you don't get through doing anything else because it is his spiritual, intimate presence through the act. It is going deeper with him. He says you cannot drink from both tables. 
All week long, the evil one wants us to drink from his table. And he says, when you drink from his table, you're drinking demons. In other words, the problem that you face is not just the problem that you face. The problem or challenges that you, I, or we face are problems that have been demonized, which is why they don't go away. They don't go away because it's not just the thing. It's the thing that's been infiltrated by demonic influence. And once it's been infiltrated by demonic influence, trying to deal with the thing without dealing with the demons haven't solved your problem, which is why it won't go away because the demons don't leave. It has been infiltrated by demons. And so to just get counseling that doesn't deal with the spiritual doesn't solve your problem because the demons aren't going away just because you go through a 12-step program. <laughs> Communion is designed to deal with demons. It is designed to deal with spiritual prisons. It is to dine to deal with our sin, but also to be the foundation of our deliverance. Because of our union with Christ, established with baptism, it is renewed through communion. There is no time where intimacy with Christ is at its peak. It's at its most dynamic, exciting moment. Then around the bread and the cup. 